Let's discuss the strategic perspective of Ukraine. First thing is, I want to have some decorum here, some scholarly academic decorum, and I call for respect in both for myself inside of this video, but also in the comments. People are dying in Ukraine right now as we speak. So this is not history yet. I prefer to study uh, historical anecdotes and examples on this channel from those very contextual um, events to extract from them almost algorithmic, dry, formulaic, you know, okay, do this, don't do that. So our lessons learned. However, in Ukraine, uh, this is still um, very much a hotly contested war. And so we need to respect that we don't have the answers yet. Speaking of, I will offer no prediction here. That's not what this is about. This is more about the perspective of what is going on, what has gone on, and, and specifically, I would like to address in this video whether or not Russia is following its own doctrine. That's the big question we will explore in this video. And then, of course, while this is an analysis, and not a prediction. Uh, this analysis takes place today. This is Thursday, 17 March, 2022. The other disclaimer, and yes, it, it's worth a disclaimer here. The other disclaimer is I want to make it quite clear that my support and sympathies go to Ukraine. After all, it is Ukraine's sovereignty that is being attacked here. Um, it is Ukraine's sovereignty, security, and its future that is at stake, in as much as its people. So I'm very much with and support uh, Ukraine. It is the Russians who have attacked. I believe that the uh, United States, the European Union, uh, NATO, and the United Nations all need to do much, much more in support, including direct support, of Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, and the Ukrainian military. And I say all of this with the following caveat. I have never harbored any animosity towards the Russian people, um, and really the only time I harbored any animosity towards the Russian government and military was when they were communist. That's when I served in the military and I took an oath to defeat them, you know, to fight them in battle. But since the 1990s, they haven't been Marxist. They're not communist today. I'd say it's far more accurate that Putin, rather than trying to reestablish the Soviet Union, which is so often heralded in the news and social media, I'd say it's far more true, or far more accurate anyway, to say that he wants to usher in the era of the czars, and he sees himself as this dynastic um, czar figure. Since I mentioned the news and the social media, let me also go say that there's propaganda out there. It's very, very hard to, uh, you know, to part the wheat from the chafe. But that's okay. I, I'm not upset about that. Look, when you are in a fight for your life, as a nation and as a people, in a military struggle, then you look to uh, your military to conduct information operations. And part of that is psychological operations, and part of that is propaganda. It's propaganda. And so we're seeing propaganda out there from every side. And not just the Russians and the Ukrainians. Oh no, we have propaganda from everybody with an agenda. So it's very, very hard to discern what is true and what isn't true, and I don't blame either side from leveraging healthy propaganda at this point in the conflict. That just makes good sense. That said, it makes it very difficult to conduct a, uh, you know, an analysis, uh, you know, from a doctrinal perspective. Having admitted that, that it's difficult to really understand a ground truth, I will say that there are two realities that we need to recognize, or that, let me say that there are two realities I recognize as of 17 March 2022. The first reality is that Russia is winning this war. I'll say that again. Russia is winning this war by any metric we want to choose. Let's choose military metrics. Let's say, is Russia seizing terrain? Yes. Are they seizing assets? Yes. And in spite of taking losses and battles and setbacks, are they remaining on the battlefield? Do they maintain control of the battle space they have taken? Yes. From any military metrics, at least traditional military metrics, that's a win. Economic metrics. Well, Russia is destroying Ukraine. 
They are destroying their Ukrainian assets systematically. The Ukraine military is experiencing incredible losses. Yes, loss in personnel, um, which are hard to replace with trained personnel, but also losses in military hardware across the spectrum, and losses in uh, command and control. They certainly are suffering losses. Infrastructure. Ukraine is losing roads and bridges and airports and seaports, so their infrastructure is just being devastated, they're losing power stations for crying out loud. Civic assets, hospitals, schools, museums and theater, arts and culture are being lost. And finally, private assets, homes and businesses are being shattered and burned to the ground. There is no metric that suggests Russia is losing on any front. The second reality that we're faced with is that Ukraine is putting up a stubborn defense. A remarkably stubborn defense. They are the underdog, and I think they have astonished the world with their military prowess and with their sheer grit and determination. So the question then begs, how long can Russia continue to win in the face of all of the pressures? Their military losses are mounting in Ukraine. That is, Russian military losses are stacking high. There are economic and political pressures at home and across the globe for the Russian uh, government and its oligarchy. And speaking of the Russian people, um, there is civil and civic unrest at home. So Russia is being pressured across all fronts. In spite of the claim that Russia is winning, I have to question how long it can sustain that. Those are my two realities from the analysis I can glean from countless resources, that is open uh, source intelligence, as well as news media, as well as social media, as well as anecdotal evidence to support any of this from friends and family uh, that I know that I can speak to who have direct contacts with boots on the ground, whether they're civilians, whether they're humanitarian workers, or whether they're military personnel, Ukrainian or foreign fighters, that have been able to confirm what I have, you know, very vaguely put together. Um, and so, here's the other thing. The analysis of Russian doctrine. Well, uh, lots of people claim to understand Red Team Army doctrine. They claim to understand it at a strategic level. I accept that. There's lots of Lots of good stuff there. Um, they Some claim to understand it at an operational level. That, again, I think that rings true. I've just seen too many fantastic sources out there. Both strategy and operations are well covered. And they claim to understand it at a tactical level. I raise a yellow flag of caution there. The same people who claim to understand this are then astonished when they witness it. Here's the deal. Um, you'll see me hold these books up and I'm going to break with uh, tradition. I normally don't touch them. I'm going to touch and actually read this. Among other types of military doctrines, I write Op 4 doctrines and that includes Red Team Ar Army doctrine, which is predicated on the Soviet. Notice I didn't say Russian. I say it's predicated on Soviet doctrine and then it um, it evolves and mutates from there. Indeed, today's Russian army is an evolution of Soviet doctrine. But nonetheless, I study it, I research it, I write it, and I publish it. And I publish it for a wide variety of agencies, uh, government and domestic and, and foreign agencies. So I'm a writer of it, and I gotta say, I'm not astonished to see what I'm seeing at all. None of this is, oh, the Russians are stupid, the Russians are losing, the Russians don't know what they're doing, the Russians are unprofessional. No, they're doing exactly what their doctrine says, and we'll go into what their doctrine says. But let me start with a, with a reference. This reference, like all of the smart books, is an amalgamation of, oh, I don't know, you'd have to open up the book and see. The point is, it's an amalgamation of many different sources on Red Team Army doctrine. And yes, while uh, it does include an overview of strategy, there are so many places out there that will offer it more in depth. Yes, this definitely includes operational warfare, of the Red Team Army, including the Russian Army today, and it certainly goes down into the tactical doctrine. I think that's where this book is most daring, is that so very few um, 
government resources are willing to do that. The last time the uh, U.S. government attempted to describe enemy tactics was 1982 in the FM 100 series. So uh, it's certainly been a minute, whereas this book was published uh, originally in 2013 in color, if you can get an old copy like that. This one you'll see is black and white on the inside, so it's monochromatic, and it was, uh, this is the second edition it was published in 2018. No doubt there will be a third edition within the next handful of years, simply because of what's going on in Ukraine with Russia right now as we speak. Um, all right, so praise for this book. Why am I bringing out this book? Because I'm going to quote from it. And so the praise for this book is when I was writing it, I had it vetted through several different um, sources. One of those sources, who will remain anonymous because he is now serving in the United States Army as a military officer, but one of them uh, was an infantry paratrooper who served in the Second War of Chechnya in 2000. And when he read over the tactics portion of this book to vet it for me, he had not met me at that time. He came, we had uh, lunch together, and he asked asked me point blank. He says, I realize you're not Russian, so you didn't serve. I said, no, I didn't serve in the Russian infantry. And he said, well, you must have consulted with several instructors because this is spot on. And I said, well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. I'd say the other great praise is simply this. Yeah, the number one consumer of this book is U.S. government intelligence agencies. So not exactly who I was targeting it to, but certainly our number one consumer. And so I'm going to say it has some credibility, has some street cred out there. It is available to you through the Lightning Press. Uh, the only reason I really haven't championed this and really gotten into Op4 Tactics on this channel yet is, frankly, I'm waiting for Op uh, Op 44, which is going to include hybrid threat, basically it comes down to insurgency and guerrilla warfare, as well as terrorists, crime cartels, everything else. That book has also been a decade long in the coming, and when it's released later this year, uh, you'll be able to buy these in bundles, quite literally, as sets and get a better deal on it later in the year. If you want it now, get it now. If you want to wait, you know, six months, like I said, you'll be able to get a bundle. If you go to um, and we will. We'll go to uh, chapter 4, page 16, which covers unconventional warfare. I'll read from that. But I think before you even go there, um, because it, it offers a, a really cool down and dirty graph, and that's what I'm going to read from, but the, it offers a graphic that I'll try to find and then you know, get the color version and include on this video. It talks about unconventional warfare, but essentially it's just flipping it. Red Team Army, and specifically the Russians, have the axe theory of escalation. And the way they describe this is they watched Western cowboy movies from the 19, you know, 40s and 50s, the old black and white, where the bad guy would walk into the bar and the good guy would stand up to, you know, to defeat him. And they would escalate the fight to the point it came, you know, pistols were drawn, right? Um, whereas that seemed very odd to the Russians who in their own culture have Easterners, that is right, horse riding kind of cowboys settling the Siberian and Mongolian fronts. So almost uh, an opposite of us, but we often forget that Russians are a cowboy culture, or at least they have uh, a nascent cowboy culture in their past. And so they always thought that was super weird because they have the axe theory of escalation, which says when you know you came to fight, when you know you came for total war, you pull out the biggest weapon you have. You don't go from fist to knives to axe, no. You grab the axe and you never use your knife or your fist. So that's the conventional uh, thinking of war. And if you're saying, well, the big axe would include nukes and biological weapons and chemical weapons, now you're on to it, now you're getting there. That is the Russian doctrine. When I know I'm going to go to war, I'm going to carry the biggest weapon system I know that wins and wins quickly. On the other hand, if that's not the case, well then we go into unconventional warfare. So what does conventional warfare look like for Russia? Well let me put this in your mind. Germany 1945, Chechnya 2000, and Georgia 2008. Many people refer to Syria, that's not actually correct, Syria is unconventional warfare, but 
It's interesting what happened in uh, Syria because eventually it escalated to something very similar to um, conventional warfare. And what I mean by that is the Russian doctrine is to exercise a movement to contact. That is to arrange your forces and to start moving. We've covered that in other, um, in other videos. A movement to contact. Once you make contact with a fortified enemy position, you do a pincer, a double envelopment to encircle the fortified uh, enemy position, and then you reduce that fortified position with artillery bombardment. Does this sound like anything you've seen in Syria? Does this sound like anything you're now seeing in Ukraine? A movement to contact on highways in March formation, and then an envelopment, an encirclement, and a bombardment of fortified positions. If you say yes, then guess what? That's not an accident. That's not desperation. That's the Russian doctrine. So that's what that looks like, and we've seen it before. It has worked brilliantly for the Russians. It's worked brilliantly for the Russians when that benefited the West. You know, Berlin. Uh, 1945. It's worked brilliantly for the Russians when that did not benefit the West, Georgia, 2008. And it's worked brilliantly for the Russians when the West was completely indifferent, Chechnya, 2000. But that is, regardless, their doctrine. There's nothing that's happening about that doctrine uh, inside of Ukraine that should surprise any of us. Yet so many people claim to be surprise. Well, what about when it's not conventional? Well, that might look like something like um, Crimea in 2014, where Russian forces painted off any uh, vehicle insignia from their wheeled vehicle, tracked vehicles, airborne vehicles, or naval, naval vehicles, and then removed insignia from their uniform, went full battle rattle into Crimea, and in 72 hours put all the insignia back on and said, yeah, it's us at first denying it for a handful of days, saying, oh, it's not the Russian people, it's not the Russian military, that's not us in Crimea taking over Crimea with the you know complacent support of the Crimean government, and oh, by the way, the Ukrainian Navy, which pretty much just abdicated to the Russians almost willingly. Very little gun battle, very little fighting, and so that was the lowest form of um, meaning the least kinetic form of unconventional warfare. I said chapter 4, page 16. Let's get to it. If I can, I will include a graph of this for you to follow along. All right? So, I just descri uh, described to you Crimea as the example. Let me tell you, level 1, covert support to political systems against Activist demonstrators, so suppress anybody who disagrees. Level two, covert support uh, to activist demonstrators against political systems, and you send in the military. And level three, covert support to armed insurgencies against the political systems. You see that in the Donbass and Luhansk uh, regions. Yes, that's where the Russian military uh, since 2014, has been arming and supporting the insurgencies in Ukraine. Moving from covert support, that is the hidden secret, we move to overt support to armed insurgency. That's certainly going on now. Overt, level five, overt support to national military against an armed insurgency. Unfortunately for the uh, Russians, the Ukrainian military did not, unlike in 2022, that is, the Ukrainian military did not side with the Russians. So then they had to go to level six, which is overt support to national military against an invading enemy. That's not uh, pertinent here. No one other than the Russians are invading Ukraine. And level seven, overt warfare against the enemy in a foreign country. So there's your, un your escalation of unconventional warfare. And, and I threw in several examples that you can see. We talked about Crimea being a low kinetic, low impact, unconventional warfare under Russian doctrine. That was wildly successful. Uh, we have seen that same thing escalate in eastern Ukraine with the separatist movements and supporting insurgencies against Ukraine. And then finally, we now see open warfare. That doesn't mean that we haven't seen Russia make mistakes. 
The biggest mistake they made was they thought Ukraine would welcome the Russians, much like they had, like the Crimean people had in 2014. At, at the very most, they would offer little resistance. Well, they got a rude awakening. The Ukrainian people have not welcomed the Russians, and the Ukrainian defense forces have put up just a brilliant and resolved defense. Um, Second, uh, the second mistake they've made is another strategic one, and that is they attacked during the wet season. Now, there was a lot of talk before they attacked, would it get cold enough? Uh, it seems to me that Russia made a an huge error here and should have waited until a drier season, say in the summer, um, to start their offensive. And the reason there is that they can't maneuver with all of that brilliant hardware they have. They've got very little uh, room to maneuver, they are stuck to the hardball, to highways and developed roads, uh, which of course uh, channelize them wickedly for ambush and, and hit and run tactics against the rear area, which the Ukrainians are doing. Um, and it allows them really only to expand in the cities. Well, that's all fine and well, but not before you reduce them. So there have been strategic errors on the Russian side that are costing them dearly right now. There's no doubt about that, but nonetheless, the doctrine is working. The other thing that people see is they're going, wow, are the Russians stupid? No. Are they as professional as we thought? No. And they rarely have been, by the way. They're, they're not professional. But even that is often misinterpreted, that we're looking for the Russians to behave like a Western army. Specifically, we're looking for them to behave like a U.S. military blue four doctrine, and they don't. One of the biggest um, parts of the Red Team Army doctrine, is certainly true for Russians, that I think is dangerous, has been their task organization to mission. That's right, let me say that again. For each mission, Red Team Armies task organize, and they do this. They've done this for 100 years. This is part of their doctrine. That unnerves me greatly. It unnerves me greatly because as a U.S. Army veteran, we were always taught that you're a, on every mission, um, you're either an asset or a liability. And if you've just attached to me, I don't know you, and whether you're leading me or whether you're a subordinate to me makes no difference. I don't know you. We haven't had the chance to rehearse yet. I don't trust you. And so you are now a liability. Well, the Russian doctrine does this, and they do, do it out of necessity for many different reasons, but they also do it out of preference. They don't trust their subordinates. So some platoon is sitting there, and it's got a lieutenant there, and a captain is put on in charge of that platoon with an attachment from battalion, and off they go down the street. And, and of course, this is shocking to Westerners who say, you haven't had a chance to, to train together. How can you trust each other? But here's the thing. The Russian platoon is practiced on battle drill. There's a great emphasis on battle drill. Frankly, far better than we do in the West. And that's a strength, not a weakness for, for the Russians. So they have battle drill, and their idea is, you know, look, there is a, uh, the platoon is probably the lowest level you ever want to do a task organization with, that's why I bring it up, but we can put a many platoons or many companies or even battalions into battle groups. And they know their battle drill. Uh, many of them don't speak the same language because the Federation is so in, in, ginormously huge that they have many different ethnicities and language barriers. So they put them together, teach them battle drill, and let's not forget that the officer in charge is responsible for everything. It is micromanaged. In the West, particularly in America, we scourge micromanagement. Shh, it happens all the time. We'll talk about that in a different video. But the fact is, we hate micromanagement. And it's seen as a weakness. But in the Red Team Army, it's seen as a strength. And it is championed. It is awarded. It is heralded. And so, given their predilection to depend on battle drill, and the fact that they expect the officer in charge to micromanage the entire mission, this allows them then to say, we can task organize to mission. And anybody in the agile business world will tell you, well, task organization to a mission is a wonderful thing. But as an American, I will say, whoo, that's scary. This is life or death. There's no room for failure. 
So task organization seems to me to be a weakness. And I think that's why we're looking at the Russians now saying, wow, they don't know what they're doing. Wrong. They're using their doctrine, just as it's designed, just as they've been trained. Two things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, I'm offering no predictions. No predictions here. This is an analysis of the current events to date as of 17 March 2022. Also, this is not history yet. So let's be a little cautious here of being overzealous in our estimates because people's lives are at stake. Thank you for joining.